Good deal. All right, we're ready to start. Well, thank you, Abraham and everyone, for inviting me to speak here today, um, giving Brad and I the last half hour before social hour always kind of ups the pressure a little bit um, because no one wants to be late for social hour, not even us. But I think, uh, I think we can do this. I think we can handle it. We're really talking about economic development today. And it's been really fun sitting here and listening to all the presentations because it's all a component of what we do every day. All of these partnerships to make things happen. And plus, when you see in our slides, there are topics we won't even have to cover in depth because there are experts right here that are covering it and have taken a deeper dive. And for that, we're really grateful. And we're really grateful for our partners in helping us get these things done. But I wanted to kind of start out with an icebreaker a little bit um, because we are talking about innovation and knowledge -based, a knowledge-based economy and technology-led economic development I wanted to know what some of you think of when I say Minnesota in Innovations. Name some Minnesota Innovations. Oh, Honeycrisp Apple. Honeycrisp Apple. <laughs> Rollerblades. Ludicrous. <laughs> Ludicrous. I'm not sure that was Minnesota. <laughs> but there you go. Soft soap, very good. My pillow. Yes, my pillow on a sleep number bed to go with it. Post-it notes. And then, you know, the implantable pacemakers and cortisone and a lot of innovation in Minnesota. Minnesota is very, very exciting. But there's one element that I've heard. Well, there's one in specific. That's what I want to say. There's one in, in all of those innovations that I did not hear, which is I don't know, it was a game-changing innovation from Minnesota. I'll give you a hint. Right. How many folks are from Worthington? Okay, you guys are known for your athleticism. I know a lot of runners. I know there are a lot of weightlifters. So you tell me what would be that innovation from Minnesota for that particular group of people. Zubats. So what? 1991. You saw guys walking down the street in those zoo huts. That was fun. So, yes, Minnesota. <laughs> that we are proud of. Um, but anyways, you know that, that culture and that spirit of innovation that has brought forth all these great innovations from the past? I mean, it continues today. It's in the DNA of Minnesotans. And that's why I'm a Minnesota homer. That's why I call myself. I am all in Minnesota. I will show stuff because I love Minnesota. I'm not happy. And so when we want to look at how that innovation continues, let's start with the basics. Minnesota is a patent powerhouse. We are second in bioscience related patents. We are second in medical patents and medical devices. Third in food composition and products patents, and fifth overall in patents per capita. <coughs> Looking at the jobs perspective, Forbes in 2015 stated that Minnesota is the fastest growing state for technology jobs. And think about it. In the first six months of 2015, there was hiring for technology workers, an increase in hiring for technology workers by over 8%. There are currently 136,000 tech workers with a payroll of almost $12 billion. And forecasted in the next decade, we're looking at 200,000 technology workers, not including the healthcare sector. So just kind of like as a big overview about Minnesota and what I love about Minnesota and this industry and our innovation is that we are we have one of the strongest life science, biotechnology, and health technology clusters in the world. It's made up of 1,700 companies that generate billions of dollars in revenues each year. And so you think about it. Where's all this innovation happening? Well, it's happening throughout the state. In every corner of the state, there's an innovation. But the thing about different regions and communities, they're not all built alike. 
in innovation technology. So communities ask, how do we begin to participate in this knowledge-based economic development? Today, you have to find your niche because it's out there. You have to find out and focus on those specific areas of technology where you have a comparative advantage. Now in Worthington, uh, they have a regional concentration and specialization in animal science, livestock, food processing, biofuels, and biomaterials. And so now they're ready, well, and they've done it, but they're ready to begin to plan building on that ecosystem for growth. So what, what, is, what are the fundamentals for building a bioscience cluster? You engage universities required for any type of R&D activity. We heard today how important it is to have your community technical colleges involved, absolutely key, to go ahead and develop skilled workers um, as well as deepen the talent pool and involve K through 12 for your future workforce. Access to capital, critical from all stages of business, from concept all the way to a mature, successful business, and one that's ready for its next phase of growth. Supportive business and tax regulatory policies. Also to begin to deploy the infrastructure that's necessary. You need a place for businesses to start out, a place that's cost effective, that they have services, um, specialized equipment, where they have water, um, but specialized equipment and space, space to grow in the future, like a research park. Um, and then patients a long-term perspective. Sorry about that, guys. Um, patients in a long-term perspective. And when I say this, because it's really easy to get distracted by the next shiny thing. And so you always have to keep your eye on the prize as you're going through all of this. As you know, you're working on your plans to build your cluster and you're thinking through it on what kind of investments you need to make in order to achieve this final goal. Keep your eye on the prize. Be patient. It will come. So the key to success, I always say, is a really solid strategic plan for, for technology-led economic development. Find your champion. You need a champion. Develop that vision. Get consensus on those goals and develop strategies and objectives, actions, and actually implement a work plan. Find the resources to implement that plan. Then measure. Measure how successful you've been throughout the years that you're achieving those goals and go back and make adjustments as things change. And always, always, always celebrate wins. Any successes should always be celebrated. You can't do that enough. And so now at this point in time that I've gone through Minnesota, innovation, the process for building a knowledge-based economy through technology-led economic development, we're going to hear from Brad to discuss how they've done it more than Thank you, Lisa. You're very welcome. As we indicated, uh, we are here today in Northern Minnesota talking about biosciences. That didn't happen overnight, it didn't happen by chance. It happened because collectively as a community, we decided that we wanted to look at our strengths and weaknesses and build on that. Back in 2003, there was a group of community leaders with about 20 individuals who went through a blended leadership program. Most people are familiar with the blended program. Good, I won't, I won't go into the, the details, but uh, those individuals, uh, as you go through the program, you have to identify, go to a SWOT analysis, analysis that I use the mic. I will do that. Thank you. Those members of the community went through a, uh, the Biden Leadership Program, went through a SWOT ana analysis that identified the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities within the community. One of the things that they recognized, which we all knew, on some level, uh, but came to the forefront was is that there's a strong presence of agricultural and animal biosciences in the region. Through that recognition, what the those leaders wanted to do was to build on that strength. So they established a goal to make Worthington region a prominent player in the agricultural biosciences in the state of Minnesota and in the 
uh, in the region itself. So uh, when they returned to the community after their leadership training, they brought in other players within the community uh, to build goals and objectives uh, to uh, establish a vision for Worthington. What they identified was building infrastructure to support biosciences, develop a talent pipeline, provide financial resources, build an industry network, and encourage entrepreneurial opportunities. Most of those five items on here, I don't know if it was by coincidence or by, by strategy by Abraham, but those are all the topics that we're talking about today. We're talking about building uh, a pipeline for training, we're talking about capital resources, we're also talking about entrepreneurial opportunities. After we established those goals and objectives, it was really needed to provide relationships. Uh, there's nothing that can be done on an individual basis. It could be done uh, through relationships. On the, the board is a list of, of organizations and companies and uh, agencies that we have provided, uh, that we have approached and worked with over the last 13 years in trying to build the bioscience relationships. With that, uh, the accomplishments that we've achieved over the last 13 years through the relationship, or through relationships and the efforts that have been made by the community, uh, obviously we wouldn't be here today if we didn't have those 20 individuals on that evening, or that, that year in 2003. 12 years, 13 years now, we've been meeting here, networking with each other. We have been inspiring entrepreneurial opportunities as well as trying to, to illustrate the strength in which we as Worthington have in, in the industry. On top of the Bioscience Conference, we also, uh, with the uh, leadership of the Worthington Regional Economic Development Corporation, which is the entity who puts on this event, um, they have invested into the uh, school district the science club. I believe it was mentioned earlier this evening that uh, Inspiring individuals to be creative and to be entrepreneurial has to happen at an early age. Through the division of Glenn Thurger and WREC, at that point in time, they made an investment into the science club at the school district level. The science club did not exist at the middle school level. Today, there are how many students? 42. 42 students that are in the eighth grade science club. Trying to start them as early age as possible and in, in, encourage them to look at the sciences and identify those opportunities that are here in Worthington. To date, probably 300 students, about 450, 450 students that have gone through the program, uh, which not only started the middle school, it led into the high school, and now our the, the first science club now is the seniors in high school, or senior in college. Yeah. So yeah. as you can tell, we're trying to build that pipeline at an early age. Um, earlier this, this evening, we talked about the uh, Minnesota West involvement into the lab tech training program. Uh, though it's, it hasn't been as successful as we wanted it to be, the foundation is there to pick it up and continue it uh, in the future. The biggest accomplishment to date at this point in time is the Bioscience Park. We are currently standing on a 98 track of land that was a failed tourism center. Through the leadership and the vision of the individuals back in 2003, identified that there was a need to provide infrastructure for bioscience companies to be successful. Through partnerships with the state of Minnesota, D, the USDA, or the, the United States Economic Development Administration, and other partners, we are standing in a 90 acre park that is home to four companies uh, that employ about 225 people here in Worthington. With that, they've made, or there's been a total, total capital investment made in the public and private nature of over $30 million since 2005. While we as a community have continued to work, or continue to work towards being a major player in the agricultural, agri agricultural and, and animal biosciences, we know that there work, there's work that needs to be done. 
we know that we can't sit on our laurels and accept the success stories that, or success that we've had so far. We need to continue to work. Beyond continuing to make investment into the human capital, which we've talked about with training and, 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 and financial resources, we as a community are continuing to provide opportunities. We're looking at completing a laboratory in our bioscience or biotechnology advancement center, which is an incubator that's just across the street. Um, I believe AURI is, is putting on a PowerPoint or a presentation tomorrow that gets more into detail of what we're looking to do. We are we still have land available within the park. We have 20 acres that's still available. We're looking to build on the synergies that we've built with the four companies that are currently here as well as uh, emerging companies that are using the incubator. And last but not least, we know that a lot of the physical infrastructure hasn't been put into place, the sewer, the water, the street, uh, but the one thing that hasn't really come to fruition is making sure that we have the strongest telecommunications opportunities uh, within the park or within the community itself. Uh, so we're making strides in, in making sure that we have the strongest telecommunications are brought down for the most part. So with that, um, I know it was a small little quick plug on Burlington, and I think it was said earlier, a shameless plug. Um, but in the 13 years that I've been involved in, in the efforts, we've never stood up and told our story. Even though we brought you all here, and we continue to bring you here on an annual basis, we talk about things within the industry and networking, which is the most important part of trying to uh, spur economic or entrepreneurial opportunities. But, you know, I think it was said earlier, we're Minnesotans, we're Midwestern people, and we don't tend to, we tend to be modest, so we don't tell our stories and tell our successes. So, we want to take this opportunity, though they ran gave us the filler spot. <laughs> <laughs> The push by giving the last bit of this between you and a drink. Which is your Yeah, yeah and, and I was worried because that first, uh, that last session, I was looking at the clock one, stretch the time because I don't have much to keep continue the past 30 minutes. So I uh, appreciate you taking the, the last few minutes of your evening uh, to hear our story. But uh, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to entertain them. If not, we're going to we're not going to interrupt you from beginning social hour. Right. But I think it was a critical time for Brad to tell the story about the city of Wilmington. They've been working on this since 2003 and really blazing the trail. Um, it's been a remarkable effort and one that I have I have genuinely <coughs> genuinely been in awe of and have deeply appreciated. And you know, I can talk a lot about making these connections and how critical they are and they actually did. So I talk about it, and so I work at making some of these connections, but they did, and they're making them actually work. Um, certainly connecting with universities for r and and you know, community and vocational colleges to do um, training for skilled workforce, and then deepening that talent pool, and then bringing it up through the K-12 through system, so kids are kind of interested in tuned in to what these STEM jobs may look like. It's awesome to talk about, but to do it's another thing, and you have done a phenomenal job. And so I just, there's, there's my big compliment. And I don't want to take, I don't want to take the, or the, the accolades because really all I am is the person who's carrying the water. There are individuals who put the vision together that have put the work and effort to make it with that vision. I'm just, I just have the privilege of being able, able to try and fulfill that vision and those goals and objectives that have been made by the members of the community over 13 years ago. And there's that humility. Yeah. Yeah. So now, since I know I've got three minutes before drink time, I'm going to tell you about a couple of our programs because I have no problem with um, shameless self-promotion a little bit. But, but Dee has been, Dee has been, and, and Bob Isaacson is here too, he's the director of the Office of Finance. They have been, I want to say, very progressive in coming up with new programs to better fit businesses and their needs for capital within the different business cycle. Um, you know, there's the r and tax credit, and there's that angel tax credit, and the angel loan fund, and the small business, in, uh, small business credit initiative. And then later stage, you know, when you're ready, 
they're kind of successful, kind of good to go. You have something to show for it, maybe get the money. We have the Minnesota Investment Fund. Um, then there's the Job Creation Fund, which kind of gets you right at that same stage as well. And then when you're really, really willing or ready to expand, there's the Job Expansion Program. And they're all a little bit different, but they're addressing needs that we've heard back from businesses. And we can make these fit with multiple different types of funding, which makes my job really, really fun. Because we have other state partners, we have federal partners, we have regional partners, and we have local partners. So we all kick in at different times that there are programs that can really make the project happen. And where I'm really going to go crazy here is, um, I am involved with the industrial biotechnology industry the most. And we pushed through our legislature, which wasn't difficult because you know what? They are really literate when it comes to the bioeconomy. But we passed through this monster production payment program for advanced biofuels, for renewable chemicals, and biomass thermal. And so, you know, you may be hearing a bit about Iowa doing a tax credit. Ours is a production payment. It's not a tax credit, you get paid. And anyone in business knows getting a check is better than getting a credit. And it's significant. Um, if you are doing an advanced biofuel from um, a regular sugar, that's 10, cents, that's 10 cents a gallon. If you're doing a advanced biofuel from a cellulosic source, that's 20 cents a gallon. Um, a cellulosic, a cellulosic based renewable chemical is six cents a pound. A cellulosic sugar is three cents a pound. A sugar based renewable chemical is three cents a pound. What really matters to a lot of companies is when they get to those maximums, and this is really for larger demonstration scale and commercial scale facilities, they're looking at um, 3 million or 6 million per year for 10 years, which means the caps are at 30 million or 60 million over 10 years. And that's huge. And that is really moving the deal for us here in Minnesota for corporate location decisions for these facilities. And location decisions and investments. So there's my shameless plug for Dean. I could not help myself. And we do have great training programs too at JSP, so thank you for highlighting that and the job training center program. Any questions here? Question back here. Uh, okay. 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 Okay.
It's, it's 503. Please help me make that speech.